So this is going to be a uh, Loic Yango. He's a postdoc in um, the the uh, working with Peter Fisher, Naomi Ray at the University of Queensland. Your I don't remember where you got your PhD in L Lille. No. Yeah, in Lille in France. Okay. Yeah, yeah you got his PhD. At, uh, is, I don't know University of Lille or University of Lille, University of Lille in France, and, <laughs> I, and I don't even know in what actually. He's good at like what I know him for is he's brilliant. He's a brilliant statistical geneticist, um, and we're really really lucky to have him here. Um, what was your PhD in, though? Uh, it's a long story. It was a long time ago. It's a long story from a long time ago, but he's an expert in assortative mating, which is what we're talking about today. So hi, everyone. Uh, well, thanks, thanks to the organizers for yeah. shipping me here from, a, from Australia. Uh, so uh, I guess I've, heard, I've chatted with some people around here, and I feel like everyone knows about assortative mating. So who, who knows about assortative mating, at least has a, a general idea of what it is? Cool, thanks. That plus the brilliant talk from James just made my life easier. So, I'll, so this is the outline of my lecture. I'll talk about general idea about assortative mating, just for us to have a, to be on the same page, but I'm pretty sure we are. I'm gonna talk about why we care about assortative mating and what does it do. Um, and in the second part, I'm gonna talk about ways we can, you know, strategies we can implement to detect and quantify assortative mating and talk about different study designs and, and how ha have a particular focus on uh, a, a method that we published last year and, and you know, that will be the time for us to interact a bit more. And finally, I'll give you some sort of overview of uh, what we have been able to achieve uh, with you know, current method based on SNP data uh, and what is left to be uh, addressed in the future. Okay, so what is assortative mating the name of? Uh, so assortative mating will basically re re reflect the fact that um, in a population, uh, people, spouses, mates, um, lovers, whatever, uh, will come, won't come, come together randomly. You know, often you will, see, you will be able to see that they will share some level of similarity on different traits. And what has been well documented is a similarity in height uh, with a correlation around 0.2, between 0.2 and 0.3 and also um, a similarity in educational attainment or IQ with a correlation uh, around the five, uh, 50%. But beyond those two traits, there is, there is also evidence, at least from the phenotypic uh, point of view, if you just simply correlate the, the trait of you know, spouses or partners, you'll find evidence of assortative mating uh, for body mass index, uh, personality-related traits, um, political preferences, which I think is important to cement the relationship, but unfortunately also for disease susceptibility, and this is what I've basically what got me to work in, t in this area. And there, there is this, um, at least this study from about three years ago in Swedish uh, study that looked at uh, psychiatric disorders, uh, a wide range of psych psychiatric disorders, sorry, and they found some evidence of spouses being uh, sharing a, um, a shared liability, similar liability to psychiatric disorder. So what do we care about assortative mating? Well, it depends, it depends on your perspective. So if you are a social scientist, uh, and you can be interested in assortative mating because that will tell you something about the dynamics of things that can uh, create or enhance inequality in a society. So if you are a geneticist, uh, at least knowing or studying assortative mating will tell you something about um, your favorite parameters of, you know, for example, heritability, because if you ignore the possibility of assortative mating, you can have uh, inconsistent results, at least uh, if you compare different studies. But uh, assortative mating also has an impact in your, on the things we do nowadays, like you know, GWASs, and um, taking into account assortative mating uh, can influence, um, or can lead to different conclusions in as what is the, um, how much variance that you know, the SNPs we detect through GWAS can explain actually in the population. And, um, and if you are an epidemiologist, um, studying assortative mating is interesting as well because that will tell you something about the prevalence of a disease. And I'll try to substantiate those claims in, uh, in the next slide. But basically, assortative mating will do something which is to increase the, the variance of the liability uh, to a certain disease. And when I say increase the variance, that increase the likelihood of observing extreme values and in other words, increase the prevalence. So knowing about assortative mating is important on this regard. So why do partners look alike? Well, it's, it's a, 
it's not a simple question, but there are, here are three well accepted um, um, explanations. And the first one is social homogamy, which basically refers to the fact that um, you're more likely to find your partner within the social circles that you attend. So an example, if you're into music, you may like you may more likely to find your partner at a concert. If you're into gym, uh, if you're into sport, you may be most likely to find your partner at a gym, for example. Okay, I decided not to make that joke, but I'll make it anyway because it's a very good it's a very good joke. And if you are into mathematics, <laughs> well, I, I tried to make the same joke at the MIT and, and people, and it didn't work, you know, I feel, <laughs> for some reason. Anyway, so the, the other reason why spouses or couples look alike is um, I couldn't find a simple, a, a shorter word for, for that, so I went for the longest phrase, which is direct choice driven by established criteria. But basically, I think that will resonate with uh, what people would do on, on online da dating or on you know this dating apps? You, know, you you come up with a profile and you want something or some, something you want someone uh, with a certain set of criteria and if that person meets that those criteria then you're happy and you you swipe. And the final one is uh, less related to the um, you know, a choice or to your sort of social environment. It's more like a convergence of a time um, because. Think about BMI. If you live with your partner uh, for many weeks, months, or years, and if you tend to share the same diet, you likely also to have a similar BMI, at least to be similar um, on body shape uh, ma matrix. So I, I will focus here on um, something which is more like you know, a direct assortment on the phenotype uh, because. Um, as I'm a statistical <coughs> geneticist and I'm interested in the evolutionary consequences. And this has been shown to have some evolutionary consequences. Oh, yeah, just a, a short intermezzo. So this is a paper um, um, that I came across uh, two years ago and that studied uh, the structure of assortment in Korea before and after the introduction of uh, online dating. And what they found is interesting is that they found that, well, Basically, uh, the reduction of um, assortative mating on geographical characteristics, so basically you're not bound to look, look for your partner where you live, but they found an increase uh, in assortment on things like education attainment, and I think I'm just trying to read here. Yeah, uh, so online dating promotes marriage that exhibit weaker so sorting along occupation and geographical proximity, but stronger sorting along education and other demographic traits. So that's interesting. So just to illustrate that what we talk about has a, you know, the way we found our look for your, our partners nowadays has a direct imp implication, which we're going to talk about now. So what are the evolutionary consequences of assortative mating? So this uh, actually goes back to uh, founding papers, uh, the Fisher 1918 that uh, James talked about, and also Wright uh, 1921, and Crow and Kimura and Gimelfarb. So there is he lots of literature about the the evolutionary consequences of assortative mating. But the core, the core conclusion from those work is that assortative mating will induce a positive correlation, uh, which is also generally referred to as gametic phase disequilibrium. You probably see that appear in the next slide as GPD. Uh, and so that gametic phase disequilibrium induced by um, assortative mating will be between alleles, um, trait increasing alleles. So this is important. There is a sign there it's a correlation between alleles that um, I think um, James referred to them as plus alleles, as if the allele increases the trait, or minus allele if the allele decreases the trait in the population. And so having those, uh, this correlation will do two things. So I just added that slide actually after seeing uh, James' slide. Uh, so if you think about a trait that is defined as you know, some genetic part, you know, the sum of our J um, uh, causal variance with uh, X, um, XIJ is the number of, say, um, increasing allele, number of plus alleles you have at that particular causal SNP J for individual I. If you look at the genetic variance, so the variance of AI, which, which you've probably seen um, um, in the past lectures, you can basically write that variance as the sum of the variance plus a term that basically involves all the covariances. So if, you, if there is no assortative mating in the population, if there is a random mating, 
you don't expect those um, alleles on different part of the genomes to be correlated. So basically, that uh, covariance term there will di disappear, will be cancelled out. But what assortative mating will do, as I just said, will, would induce those correlations between increasing alleles, so that will create a, a directionality there, which will make that final term not to disappear. And the consequence of that, the direct consequence, is that the variance of uh, added, the genetic variance in the population will increase. All right. So there is another more local um, um, consequence, which is also the, in the increase of uh, homozygosity um, at the particular locus. So that means that you're more likely to find at the causal locus to find plus plus individuals having the plus plus alleles or the minus minus alleles. So the increase of homozygosity. But almost rapidly uh, in right 1921, it has been shown that this increase of, of um, homozygosity is actually pretty small. It is inversely proportional to the number of causal variants. So if you think about a trait which is polygenic, which has a 10 million causal variants, that actually is very uh, is negligible. Yeah. Uh, sorry, so you asking? So why is it obvious that it increases the variance? Okay, uh, that's a good point. I think it will increase the variance if there is positive assortative mating. Uh, I, I sort of assume, thanks for bringing that, I sort of assume that um, the, the general um, pattern for assortment is a positive. You know, you're more likely to, if you're tall, more likely to go for a tall partner. <laughs> but we were actually talking about that yesterday at dinner. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of many examples of negative assortment. You know, when you uh, were just talking about with Lauren, maybe personality, you went to, may want to balance your personality. I, I don't know, but mo most of the evidence we have is uh, some positive assortment. And because of that positive assortment, you expect uh, that increase of variance. It's coming from, this increase comes from the positive assortment. Yeah. On some traits, at least, you actually have. I think that there, uh, that you're giving, you're giving a good example. There are examples there where there are people who um, will mate between ethnic groups, right? Uh, but I think it's if you look at this at the population level, mm -hmm. it's still it's still not. Uh, no, most of the most people will mate within their uh, ethnic ancestry group. I'd probably say. So. What we're talking about are we're talking about correlations uh, at the population level. So these are just two uh, examples, two questions. Um, maybe someone if you can ask to answer those that, those questions. So the first one is: Is the correlation between strong effect alleles stronger than between weak effect alleles? So imagine you have a trait with alleles that have you know, a strong effect and alleles that have a smaller effect. And because of assortative mating, do you expect the correlation to be stronger between effect alleles that have a stronger effect than it is uh, between alleles that have a weaker effect? Does any, anyone has an idea? Okay, so there is no clear answer to that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would say that uh, you actually don't expect those, that correlation to change. Um, if, you talk, if, you, if you're dealing with, um, say, a polygeny trait, I think the, the only cases where you, you will find, think about uh, a variants that have a massive effect. You know, if you can tell, so the assortment is based on what you can observe, right? You, if you're tall, you're going for a tall person. But when you select someone to be tall, you just Looking at the phenotype doesn't tell you if that person is tall because he has that person, he or she has, uh, say, two big effect alleles and, say, five small effect alleles or the other way around. You just see the phenotype. And because you don't, you don't actually observe um, um, the, the genetic value, that correlation is actually uh, agnostic of the, the effect size, unless you have traits with a massive effects where you can tell that it's probably due to a single mutation or... How could that possibly be true? Like, like the, if you're, is, are you suggesting there's like a discontinuity? Like, let's say you go from zero to like, 
an epsilon sized effect and then you and you like increase like there's not going to be a sudden change going from zero to epsilon right mm -hmm. and i mean i do um I mean, it seems like the big, even even though you can't know whether it's one big or too small, um, I mean, it seems more likely that it's the the one big if you see a tall person. So, so I don't know. I mean, it just it seems like there's funny, you know, claiming that there's no reason to think seems a bit, a bit strange. Well, I think it's it's we can we can easily understand what's happening in this sort of infinitesimal case where you know that we have infinite number of uh, variants with very small effects, where you can it's easier I think to imagine that. Uh, you know, the, the variation in effect size probably won't matter uh, with respect to that correlation. But on the other side, I'll come to you, Miles, in a second. Uh, on the other side, think about um, a mutation that will um, lead you to be one meter high. Your height would be one meter. So I guess if you, if you uh, assort on that, you know that it's not because of your polygenic tail controlling height. It's probably assorting directly on the mutation. So the correlation you will observe on that variance will be stronger than for the rest of the variance controlling height. But if it's in like the small, you know, like like a, a, a variance that has an R squared of like 0 0.02 versus one that has 0 0.01, like yeah, you, you don't think that there's a, 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 any relationship between? At least uh, if you if you read Crow and Kimura, it will say that the overall the the <laughs> you know, basically the variance of your effect sizes. Yeah, the sort of spread of uh, effect sizes will will impact the, the average correlation, but not specifically. At least this is from reading Kuro Kimura. But I feel like it's it's a it's an interesting question. I think we we could try and quantify that. I feel like that's a uh, something we can uh, we can explore now. So this is, this is about the same question. That if you if you think of the increase of the variance due to a sort of mating, that's that's coming from these covariances, and if you imagine that that total amount of co covariance being divided over a million squared pairs instead of um, instead of ten squared pairs, then then the, the the covariance is going to have to be much you know much much smaller because it's going to go like the the square of the number of causal SNPs and and then that covariance is going to be divided by variance, but you think that the variance would still be mostly unaffected by the by the uh, assorted mating. So, so I, I actually think that the correlation should go down roughly like the square of the number of of causal SNPs if they're all of the same kind of a. Uh, well, I think the, the the correlation you observe between low 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 signs is roughly the same that you observe within lo locus. You know, if you basically shuffle alleles in the population and people will sort uh, randomly this way. Uh, but I think what will, if I understand well your point, and, uh, but we can, we can con discuss that uh, in more de detail after, after the, the lecture. So you have a very small correlation which basically uh, is it s gets smaller as you have the more causal variance. But what will overall induce the, 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 the increase in heritability is because you have um, m squared of the order of m squared pairs and a cor correlation which is of the order of 1 over m. So even m becomes small or large, I think that you still have this relationship which predicts that your, your inflation will probably be um, stable. Uh, I'll skip the second question and we move, move on. So how can we quantify assortative mating? Uh, so Almost by design, assortative mating is about you know, spouses, partners, lovers, whatever you want. Uh, so a, a natural way to quantify assortative mating is to create a steady design where you, you have spouses. So if you, have, uh, you recruit spouses and you have traits uh, measured on those spouses, you can correlate and estimate correlations between spouses. So that's like the direct uh, phenotypic, uh, what I call direct, oh, it doesn't work. Uh, direct estimation of phenotypic correlation, that's like the, the gold, gold standard uh, um, study designed to quantify assortative mating. Uh, but there is something interesting. I said earlier that the reason why uh, spouses or couple look alike is because, well, it could be because of um, social, social homogamy, it could be because of uh, direct choice, or it could be because of convergence. So when you simply have a, a one number that tells you that spouses are correlated, you, you actually don't know if it, they are correlated because of mate choice or if they are correlated because of the environment. 
So one way you can try, try to get, uh, gain insight um, in, you know, to sort of, sort of trying to break down that correlation is as what comes from matrix and what may come from environment uh, is to look at longitudinal uh, follow-up. So you have maybe people that you observe at the early after uh, their marriage. I think I we're talking about, I don't know who, oh, maybe it was you, Lauren, actually. <laughs> so early, around your, your, your marriage, you want to fit with your wedding dress, so you, you, know, <laughs> you, probably, you may behave in a per certain way, <laughs> and maybe three years after, or 10 years after, uh, it applies to the, the guys as well. Uh, five years after, you probably act differently. Uh, so if you, if you have multiple time points, you can, you can tell, at least try to quantify to which extent uh, that correlation between spouses come from environment or from nature's. But you know, having that type of data is, is not often uh, easy. Uh, so more recently, people have been basically lev leveraging uh, the availability of genome-wide association studies uh, to answer that question. Because you can almost predict your phenotype, uh, your phenotype and as well the phenotype of your future partner um, at birth. If you have a polygenic score, a genetic predictor of the phenotype, and if you find um, a, a correlation of polygenic scores between spouses, that tells you something about associative mating which is probably um, uh, not environmental. It's probably most likely uh, be because of uh, a direct made choice or so, um, social homogeneity. Do you have any comment here? Uh, and more recently, um, uh, people have been trying to answer that question in a more indirect way, uh, where you basically uh, want to learn assortative mating through information you may have about the parents of the people, because often it's easier to get uh, to collect unrelated individuals than it is to collect spouses. So there are a lot of databases out there uh, where people have information either on their parents, so if you have information on their parents, even without having the genetic, um, uh, the genotype of the people, you just have a questionnaire about their parents, what time they, um, you know, what type of disease they had, uh, what, what was their salary, etc. You can learn something by in just asking information about the parents. So that's one way as well. Uh, and but if you, have, if you have the, g the genotype of the people, uh, you can learn something about assortative mating in the parental generations uh, by also looking at correlations between different parts of the genome. As I said, one of the sort of signature effect of assortative mating is that it will induce that correlation uh, um, between alleles all across the genome. And I actually realized that we, should, we could have spent a little bit of time on on that question, the second question which I discarded, which is the difference between the, that correlation that we're talking about, the gametic phase disequilibrium and linkage disequilibrium. So the core, I'll just answer the question, the core difference is that linkage disequilibrium will only apply to loci that are physically um, uh, close. Whereas gametic phase disequilibrium can be induced uh, even between, you know, well, you, there's evidence of long-range LD, you know, if, uh, you know, when I say between low side that I close on the same chromosome, you have to define what is close, is it one megabase, is it 10 megabase, and you can still find some LD uh, even within five megabase. But the gametic phase equilibrium will, will affect their uh, alleles that are even on different chromosomes. And this is what the, the core idea we like to, uh, to leverage here to quantify assortative <coughs> mating. Yeah. And this is a nomenclature kind of issue, but I'd always thought that the gametic phase, and I, I could be wrong, so I'm just actually looking at this question, but the gametic phase of equilibrium was, was more about the directionality and that we're, have, we're keeping a consistent direct directionality because the expected correlation is positive. Mm -hmm. um, whereas you can still have very long range even across chromosome LD, for yeah. example, due to if, replication. Yeah. Or population size, yeah. Is that is that nomenclature that you would, or, or is GPD just about the, the distance? Yeah, you ma you're making good point. Yeah, I think, I think here, thanks for that. I think gametic versus equilibrium will also have as attached in it this idea that uh, there is a directionality in the correlation. Uh, you, can, you can observe actually cross, I didn't want to get into those details, you can observe cross chromosome LD uh, because of uh, effective population size. If you have a small, Population size. You know, imagine that's just 
everyone here, I don't know if their sex ratio is balanced, but anyway, uh, we just decided to create our own population from now. Well, we're not so many. So within, if you look at the correlation between chromosome of our descendants, you'll find some, some correlation there. But it won't, it won't be directional as, a, as the incre increasing alleles will be correlated. Yeah, Mike. Well, I think part of the answer is, is Loic's list of different things. There's, in a sort of mating, there's hom homogamy, just you're hanging out with people <coughs> who are similar to you. And then there's, there's the more intentional kind of a sort of mating. And once you include the assorted mating from homogamy, then the stratification is a type of assortative mating. So there isn't some clean break between assortative mating and stratification. Stratification is a particular subtype of assortative mating that has to do with homogamy, the fact that most of the people around you are of the same, you know, if you're, in, if you're a German, most of the people around you are Germans, and you're more likely to End up, end up mating with somebody who's German. That's a type of assorted mating. It's just from this somewhat, some from homogamy as opposed to the intentional choice. Okay. I'm not sure I agree with that, but. Uh. Well, I guess we, we, we can, can get later on this. Uh, yeah, so just want to hear to illustrate, uh, and this is an, uh, an example from uh, 2017 paper that looked at. Um, genetic assortative mating um, and phenotypic assortative mating. And they wanted to basically quantify how much of the correlation uh, between spouses uh, for height and BMI was um, explained by mate choice versus convergence. And so here you have uh, different, um, so you have the phenotypic correlation for height and their panel B for BMI. Uh, and then they have this other analysis where they basically look at uh, uh, the prediction, how the regression of the, the co-spouse phenotype on the predictor of, of the particular trait on the, say, the spouse, the first spouse. And so if uh, there is a direct, so if the assortment is directly on, if the resemblance between spouses is explained by, um, by mate choice, you expect uh, that phenotypic estimate from the phenotypic correlation to be exactly the same um, uh, as the regression of, say, taking the, the, the height of the, the husband regress on the polygenic score um, um, of height uh, using genotype of the, of the wife and vice versa. Um, there is one property that polygenic score has to have this sort of blob uh, property, uh, which probably uh, not relevant to, det to detail here. Basically say that this property doesn't hold if you just use any type of polygenic score. But nonetheless, what interesting thing is that for BMI, there is evidence there that actually the, the, the correlation between the co-spouse uh, trait and the, 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 uh, and the polygenic score from the spouse, first spouse is actually smaller. It's about half of it. So this is evidence that the resemblance we have uh, between spouses on BMI is only partially um, driven by mate choice, and probably half of it is because of environment. Yeah, so now I'm going to talk about a bit more in detail about this, uh, this paper that we published last year. Yeah, you have a question there. Um, uh, would I expect the correlation to be lower? Uh, suppose I suppose have lots of measurement error where the things that you're telling me uh, don't. Yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't that make the difference? Yeah, I think that that's the thing about this blood property. So your polygenic score, uh, you basic what I mean by blood property is that you expect the regression uh, uh, of your um, the trait regressed on the, the, the particular blob prediction, predictor to have a slope of one. So because of that property, you sort of design your polygenic score to have that property. Uh, you sort of expect that, uh, well, it, yeah, talk about correlation. The traits were standardized, so basically, even though it's the correlation, you can, you can also estimate that as a regression of uh, this height or BMI of spice one and BMI of spice two. So that, that study uh, was basically trying to uh, quantify the signature of assortative mating, which is the correlation uh, between uh, increasing alleles on different part of the genome as a way to detect uh, and quantify assortative mating. So the method is relatively simple. It tries to uh, use two pieces of, of information. The first one is uh, assortative mating creates this correlation between increasing alleles. So it's therefore 
uh, uh, critical to know the direction of the association. You have to know which one is the plus allele and which one is the minus allele. So to inform that decision, we use summary statistics from uh, genome-wide association studies for multiple traits. And the second uh, piece, is, piece of information we use is that under random mating, assuming that the population size is large enough, you actually expect the correlation between chromos bet the correlation of alleles between chromosomes to be uh, nearly zero. So just a way to illustrate that, uh, so this is what happens. So you imagine you have, uh, so th these are three individuals, and you have just looking, this is just a um, haploid representation of the genome, so just one stretch of, G of, um, of DNA. So for this three, five people, uh, three people, you have the number of plus alleles. So the first one has five plus alleles, the second one has uh, four plus alleles, and the third one has three plus alleles. And this is just looking at uh, plus alleles on, say, one chromosome. I just call that odd chromosome. So it would be chromosome one, three, et cetera, an odd chromosome. So under random mating, as I just said, you don't expect the number of plus alleles on odd chromosome to be anyhow predictive of what's happening on, on the even chromosome. So this is what happened on uh, random mating. I just you know, create this situation where if you look at the correlation of the number of plus alleles uh, in this context, it's actually around zero. Whereas under resortative mating, because of this sort of population correlation which is induced, uh, you actually expect um, the number of plus alleles on the even chromosome to be predicted by what's happening on the, on the odd chromosome. Yeah. Um, do we have a sense of how quantitatively important um, some of the discussions earlier about sort of other reasons for, for um, correlation across chromosomes might be? Um, okay, so overall, I think those correlations are small. And you'll see, I'll, I'll give some of the numbers in uh, the next slides. But the correlation you expect, as Matt was saying, uh, because of assortative mating, is, is a directional correlation. So it's a correlation between, uh, say, uh, plus alleles. <coughs> so although it is small, under just random mating or, um, well, let's, let's not talk about uh, population stratification because you can think about it as a form of assortative mating, as Mike was saying. But if there is no population uh, stratification, just you know, because of different evolutionary forces, you expect those correlations to be of the order of 10 to the minus 5, whereas under assortative mating, you actually get correlation around uh, 10 to the minus 2 or 10 to the minus 3. So there's multi there are orders of magnitude differences. So uh, the way the method works is, as I said, we use summary statistics from genome-wide association studies. So this is how it looks like. You have information about uh, what SNP has been tested and which chromosome it lies, which allele has been tested, and a measure of the effect sizes, you know, the correlation of the a measure of how that that particular allele will correlate with the trait. So we have this uh, direction attached there. We know it's the mag we have both have the magnitude and also have the, the direction. And so what we do now from that, we go and look for uh, a cohort that is independent of our GWAS. Um, the reason why we want independence, uh, I mean here independence in the sense of no overlap, no sample overlap. Uh, the reason is because if there is overlap, that will induce some of biases, and we can, uh, um, I, we, I can detail that later. It's not, it's not cr critical. Let's assume that we have this independence. And finally, for each individual in that population, we will calculate two quantities. We will calculate a polygenic score from uh, SNPs on the odd chromosome, so uh, chromosome one, three, et cetera, and uh, another polygenic score from um, SNPs on the even chromosome. And if we found, we detect the correlation between those polygenic scores, that will tell us something about assortment, not in those people, because we, we just, we don't know with whom they, they've been hanging out. We just you know, observed, collected their genomes. But, but because they were born, we know something about their parents, how their parents selected each other. And actually, we ca also capture things that might go uh, beyond their parents and multi previous generations. Cool. So uh, we can theoretically derive what is that correlation that we'll detect. Uh, this derivation was made under the assumption that assortative mating has been happening for multiple generations until some equilibrium. The equilibrium is more like a, uh, it's intellectually appealing, it's 
basically never happens because the sorts of meeting changes for many reasons. We just have this example in Korea, you know, when the technology changes, people just change their way of mating or pairing. But the interesting thing about it is that uh, Pram, this correlation between uh, polygenic score and odd and even chromosome, which we termed as theta, uh, is that it has interesting properties. One is that it increases uh, monoto monotonically with the correlation between spouses. So that's what it's a good thing because this is what we want to detect. It, it also uh, increases with the heritability, uh, yeah, which is a nice property. But unfortunately, it will decrease with the polygenicity being the number of causal variants, which is a bit challenging. But I think we can understand intuitively why it, it, it is, because as I said before, the expected uh, correlation we expect is inversely proportional to the number of causal variants. So if you have a very polygenic trait, this induced, um, the induced correlation is pretty small. And basically what we have here inherits the same, the same drawback. Oh, and one final thing, uh, because um, we, we, not, we, we don't know for sure uh, which one is the increasing alleles. Actually, many things. We don't know, we, from genome-wide association studies, we don't know the cause of variance. We have things that are correlated with the cause of variance. Uh, and secondly, the genome-wide association studies can vary in sample sizes. So we have estimates of the, the, the association between that particular allele and the trait, but the confidence of this association depends on the sample size. If we have a uh, a a genome a GWAS of a million people it doesn't doesn't give the same confidence as having a GWAS with say 5,000 individuals and so that's why we have in this formula so this theta parameter has this ideal uh, term that we want to capture plus another term which depends on n n be being here the sample size um, um, of your GWAS where you got your summary statistics from so that's the pr I feel like it's the best we could do at the moment it's, it's, it gives a funny, funny thing because if you, if you think in, in statistical, uh, you know, the classical statistical machinery, you want to estimate the parameter, which is a true parameter for the population and you sample individuals, you run your inference and you estimate a parameter. Whereas here we have a parameter which depends on how much information we have to start with from a different study, which is funny uh, in terms of asymptotics. Yeah. Thank you. So the F0, uh, uh, I, 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 I plan to come back to that later, but the F0 is, uh, is a measure of how much variance your SNP will capture from the true heritability. OK, so two sources of biases in this, uh, this parameter, estimating that parameter. The first one is sample overlap that I said, well, discard that, that problem by making sure that we have, uh, we we carry our inference in, in a sample that doesn't overlap with the GWAS. So that's a very simple fix to that solution. Uh, and another source of bias is population structure. Uh, it may or, not, may or may not be seen as a bias um, because a so population structure, as we just discussed, is a form of assortative mating. But often, uh, at least in that study, I was interested in assortment on things that are not just ancestry or know, geography. Yeah. Uh, we know that, you know, as uh, Mike was saying, German are more likely to marry Germans, but I was most interested in knowing whether tall Germans are more likely to marry tall Germans. And so if you, and that's why it's a bit challenging, because especially for the case of height, because within Germany, why do we talk about Germany? Well, <laughs> 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 well let's just change that to, to Finland. Yeah, bad example. Congo. I was born in Congo. So within Congo, you have this north-south gradient um, uh, with people from the north being having more pygmy uh, ancestry, so they're shorter. Yeah. And so even though there, there's uh, assortment happening on a sort of a geographical ancestry, you still have um, within those homogeneous uh, geographical areas, you still have some assortment happening on, on height or different traits, and this is what we're trying to, to capture. And, and because of that, we want to basically remove that um, geographical or ancestry-based uh, effect, which is one of the challenges we had to face. And I'm from the south of Congo. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Could you possibly go back to the, the slide with the first introduction of data? This one? Uh, for that one. For that. One for that. <sighs> there we go. Thank you very much. Um, 
Uh, can you get more information out of data by... So, so here you've regressed um, polygenic score from all of the odds and all of the evens. But I can imagine if you um, made perhaps a polygenic score from a single chromosome and regressed it on a polygenic score from all of the other chromosomes yeah. and did that continuous, uh, and did that many times, then those observations wouldn't be independent, but you could make, you could make some um, standard error correction for that and then maybe get a more... So you're asking about the standard error? Uh, yeah, or, 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 but, but also why you chose to go with only Okay, so arbitrary. Uh, I, th I think it was convenient for, because the, in humans, if you split the genome as odd and even, you roughly get a, a balanced partition in terms of number of SNPs. But, but maybe there's, there's more information if you do it um, in the So the, 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 sh the short answer is that there is a supplementary uh, analysis in the paper where we looked at different ways of pairing the chromosomes. I think uh, having that partitioning the genome into, um, uh, say, equally sized bits is interesting was interesting for the theory because you know, basically uh, your regression of polygenic score A on polygenic score B is the same as the correlation. So you can, every, you can because the, the number of SNPs is the same, the variance of the polygenic score is roughly the same. So the theory was more elegant this way. There is nothing, uh, in terms of, I think it's interesting. The the sorry? Say um, Yes, but, but I think well, what you can, um, when you standardize, imagine the, cor the correlation you have between chromosome one versus the rest of the genome depends on how many pairs you have between causal alleles on cr chromosome one versus the rest of the genome. So it is of the order of the number of variants on chromosome one times the number of variants elsewhere. Oh, yeah, but I guess the, the true correlation, like what is induced in the population, depends on you know uh, the number of pairs you 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 have right uh, I'm, I'm not sure I get your question then uh, I'm not sure I get your question, okay <laughs> well I mean I think it's he was just saying that maybe a different parameter that involves like not just taking you know you, you've arbitrarily split the SNPs into even odd yeah. but you could consider every possible SNP you could estimate all of them and then meta-analyze them in a way that takes into account the correlation and maybe have something that's more powerful. But, but I don't know that... No, I think you, you're make, making a point. The point is, uh, if you want to detect the, the assortment, if you're simply interested in knowing, is there something different from zero, there are better ways of doing that, yeah. And especially if you think about the regression, you want to regress on a polygenic score that has the largest variance. So the ideal case will be, to select your smallest chromosome that you regress on the rest of the, th that will give you more power in terms of you know, uh, standard errors. But here I wanted to also have something w which we can sort of easily um, connect with the theory and want to say, is that theta that I estimate, can I predict that from things that I know in the population? If, I'm, if you give me the heritability of the trait, how much variance is captured, and how much causal variance we think they are, we can vary that parameter and different things. Can we actually predict what that theta is and verify that with theory and with uh, empirical data? And it was, I think that framework was um, uh, more amenable for, th for that reason. So what we, so I'll probably skip that part. Uh, yeah. I mean, I only want the short version now and I'll get the long version from you later, but if I don't, I don't understand why using overlapping samples biases things. It's clear that it does because you can do it both ways and it biases things terribly. Mm -hmm. But mathematically, I don't understand why, because it's not like the usual case. It's not like the usual case where you can easily work out the algebra of why it biases things to do an overlapping sample. Do you have intuition about why it biases things so badly when you have an overlapping sample? Uh, the intuition. I think I would say s that. So, if you run your GWAS in a in a population, you will find your effect sizes to be correlated between chromosomes uh, because they are they come from the snow. Everyone is uh, your linear. I think about it on ordinary least square estimate, right? They all come in it's the regression on the y, right? So they have this in inherent correlation that comes from that. So therefore, 
when you, when you want to quantify the correlation between different chromosomes from effect size that you're estimating in the same sample, you will find a correlation there, a positive correlation, which will be <coughs> probably captured through assortment, but something also that comes from this sort of uh, correlation of the estimators. The estimators are correlated, right? And so I, I try to, to work out a theory. It's, it's not that hard. I just, you know, whenever I was coming with that question, uh, you know, speaking with different co-authors, uh, was simpler to just say, well, you know, we have GWAS, we have independent populations, and let's make the, the message uh, uh, straightforward. But I think it's, you, you I, I'm pretty sure, uh, I've the last time I've derived that was a long time ago, but I'm pretty sure you can work out what is that uh, bias that comes from this over sample overlap and, and subtract that, that effect. Probably uh, the, the, the right thing to do. Uh, I will jump to, um, to the, some of the results that we have. So we apply that using different traits. Uh, I collected uh, s summary statistics from 32 genome-wide association studies, and I calculated those polygenic scores using SNPs that have some level of association with the trait. So I filter the SNPs to, to be marginally associated with a p-value lower than 0.05, another arbitrary choice, uh, which I'm happy to discuss the details of that if you want. But basically, uh, the, the, the intuition of that is, um, depending on your sample size, um, using too many SNPs can actually lead to a predictor that has a lower prediction accuracy uh, than just filtering the variance on, on p-value. That's a, it's, it's a score intuition. So you want to maximize how well your predictor will explain of the trait because that will give you more confidence on your inference. And the independence here is, um, is a bit, is a way of basically re removing uh, linkage disequilibrium uh, between variants, so just be building a polygenic score out of SNPs that are associated with the trait and independent from one another, not correlated. So I run this estimation in three populations. So the GWAS were from studies that did not overlap with those three populations, so no overlap with the UK Biobank. I don't know if you heard, have you heard about the UK Biobank? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot. Uh, no overlap with this uh, cohort um, from the US, which acronym is JERA, and uh, no overlap with this uh, health and retirement study, HRS, uh, which had a smaller sample size. So what we found uh, is that we found for high to correlation between odd and even chromosome um, corrected for population stratification. We found uh, estimates around 3%. So this is what you, you look here. So each bar co corresponds to a different population. And I, I also hi highlighted this horizontal dotted line, which represents uh, the prediction we can make from the theory, this theta equation that you saw before. So this is just a prediction using one value of the number of causal variants. Um, which we, no, we don't know for sure. So in the supplementary, I consider different, different numbers of you know, the number of calls of variance between 1,000 and 10,000 or 100,000, and it doesn't make a, uh, a massive difference there. So that's the estimate you get for height and educational attainment. So this is, these are the, out of the 32 traits analyzed, uh, it was both reassuring and a bit disappointing to just come up with what we sort of expected before, but you know, another orthogonal way of addressing the question. And for educational attainment, we found an estimate around 2%. Uh, well, I think the meta-analysis is around 2.5%. And we found that the, the prediction didn't do that well. And it's, um, well, I guess it's, it's based on a lot of assumptions, um, including the, the assumption that the population has reached equilibrium. And there are some uh, orthogonal um, analysis suggesting that it may not be the case uh, in the populations we, we've looked at, especially for educational attainment, where the assortment might have changed over time. So that could explain as well why we, we didn't match as well the theory. And finally, there is this example of bone mineral density, which we chose as a, as a null trait, uh, because there is no, at least no known evidence of assortment on bone mineral density. If you happen to measure that on spouses, you, you should find a correlation around zero. Uh, the theoretical prediction is, uh, I just work out what is, so imagine you have a trait with uh, uh, M calls of variance, 
and you run a GWAS on that trait, and you get SNPs that are correlated with those M calls of variance. Uh, and and then ba basically just follow the machinery you know, of the inference. You, know, you have this, you split your 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 GWAS into two sets of equally sized uh, um, SNPs, number of SNPs. You create polygenic scores from that, and you correlate and just work out what is the expected uh, correlation between those polygenic scores. And that depends on different things, as I say. Yeah, that's the theory I mean. And depends, yeah, mostly on the correlation between spouses, which we want to quantify as well. Yeah, Chess. Um, so if <laughs> the theoretical prediction looks pretty good for height, um, so but wouldn't that predict then that if you looked at height um, betas within families, that they would somewhat decline? Uh, but I believe in EA3 we looked at that and we didn't really see that, or? The betas did decline within I think, yeah. I think they, they, for height, height. Yeah. Well, they, oh, did, height, they right. did a lot for EA, but. Yeah, I but think for height you expect about 20%. It's pretty, it's, it's pretty small decrease in, a predicted decrease in beta, yeah, so. It may be that it was, yeah, outside the standard errors were not precise enough in the spouses that we had. I don't, I'm, I'm not sure though, that's a good point. Well, from, from theory you expect a, a decrease around 20%. Right. Yeah. Of the effect size, so I don't so remember how many. Um, they were pretty close, though, like hmm. ninety something percent. I agree. I'll look it up. Um, it will take me a minute. So <laughs> yeah, this is the weeds now. We better oh, get back sorry. <laughs> sorry, Alex. I saw that you've been emailing. Well, Where are you? So what? Well, I took is uh, my measure of the importance of assorted mating. The the ratio of the variance that we see in the population, or whatever the implied variance is, to what the variance would be if there were zero assorted mating. Can, can, can you translate these numbers into that? So just, just this variance ratio between what the variance is given the assorted mating that there's been historically yeah. divided by the variance that would be there with no assorted mating. What, what would the numbers be for these traits? Uh, for these traits, I uh, think for height, it's interesting because so assorted teeth mating will induce uh, an increase in the genetic variance and therefore in the phenotypic variance as well. Uh, but if you basically look at the in inflation of the genetic variance and compare that to the inflation of heritability, which somehow you know, takes into account both the inflation of genetic variance and of phenotypic variance, you get slightly different numbers. So for height, I'm not, I'm, I don't remember on top of my head for educational assignment, but for height, you expect uh, um, an inflation of around 15, 15 to 19% uh, of the genetic variance, but the actual inflation in heritability is actually of the order of 5% because of those two things happening on the numerator and the denominator. Uh, I have to double check the, um, my, the, those numbers for educational assignment. But I guess those predictions are mostly based on some, some equilibrium. You, know, you have to assume that some equilibrium has been reached before. Yeah, Patrick? Uh, it's 10%. So the height, the height estimates were 10% smaller with the standard error of 0.02. So OK. So half. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, one of the big differences is we, we were talking about stratification. One of the big differences with stratification is that those are those are huge inflations of the variance. So if you talk about stratification, it, it, it you know it's certainly different in magnitude in dramatic ways. You can get you can get these variance ratios that are like ten or or something for the first QTs. Of course, the the first QTCs are selected for being things that have big variances, and almost all of that variance is from from inflation because of this homogeneous. Hmm. Well, I think that that is par partially explained by, you know, I think the correlation of ancestry or local ancestry is, is strong, but also that I think it doesn't take many variants to determine local ancestry. So you have two things. You have the correlation between spouses, which is larger, and you have, if you think about ancestry as a trait, is probably not as polygenic as height. So you, you're expected, um, um, in correlation between you know, alleles that contribute to determine your ancestry is probably, uh, yeah, not. Well, I mean, I think if you, if you, if you simply do a GWAS and, and put ancestry on the left hand side and do a GWAS, then 
in that sense, ancestry is very highly polygenic. You don't need many alleles to predict ancestry, but if you just say, what are all the alleles that in fact do help you at least a little bit in predicting ancestry, it's a huge number of alleles. Yeah, so I think ancestry was probably not, well, it was talking about things that you, if you look at within, within a country, for example, north and south, you know, the, the FST is not that large. You know, so you have actually few variants that will tell you, you know, that it's like more recent history. You know, some people have migrated over the you know, past 100 years mm -hmm. to some part of the country, and yeah, that's why I, what I meant. And the, the correlation should be flipping around with respect to directionality unless I think there's some mean difference between the mm. ancestry groups. Right? Yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, I very much like what you said about weight and height. It seems, and correct me if I'm wrong, there's more heritability associated with height than weight. Mm. Uh, well, I the heritability, the heritability is larger. Yeah. Yes. So, do you think because like height is uh, less mutable than weight? Like, I want to know your thoughts, or if you've read something related to that, is there a correlation or inverse correlation between heritability and immutability between traits? So, the more mutable a trait is the less heritable it could be. Well, what do you mean by mutable? I'm not so sure. So weight, like, you know, we can gain or lose weight easily, but height is fixed, is more like the constant. Ah, you, well, <laughs> maybe, if I, if I may maybe translate in terms that I am more confident with, mm -hmm. are you talking about in the polygenicity, the number of variants controlling the trait? Is that? Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Uh, um, I think it was more about whether a trait can change over time, right? And there must be some relationship with heritability, not necessarily. Exactly. It depends on when you measure it. There's going to be more what we would call error or environmental variance in, in the, that would make the denominator bigger of the heritability estimate. Mm -hmm. So we've got another good question. So I've forgotten this thing about BMI, and that's somewhat inconsistent with what Robinson. Yeah. Found. What, what is your so answer to that? So. I showed you before that, that study, uh, which was partly done in the UK Biobank, actually, well, it was done in the first release of the UK Biobank that looked at uh, you know, pr predictors of height and BMI between spouses and found some evidence that you know, BMI was partially, the resemblance of between spouses on based on BMI was partially created by you know, due to mate choice. So you were, were sort of expecting to see a signature there as well for BMI. And so we didn't find it. Uh, the short answer is, I'm not sure why. Uh, there are probably many reasons. Why is that we used uh, um, a GWAS which probably was overcorrected you know, because we had this polygenic score based on SNPs that were m mildly associated with the trait. And I know that this, this GWAS was, you know, they applied this double GC correction. And, and basically, the predictor that you get wasn't that good at predicting BMI to start with. That's one thing. The other thing is also the sort of inherent polygenicity of BMI, which has more causal variance. And, and you basically expect uh, way larger GWAS to sort of compensate that uh, polygenic polygenicity effect here. But I guess that's, uh, I was talking about that with Patrick as well, using uh, his method that, I don't know if you're going to talk about it this week, maybe not. It's, uh, it's more like uh, Patrick has been working on a generalization of that uh, approach. and. Uh, even with that more general method that takes into account correlations between all the chromosomes, uh, there is still no signal about BMI. So it's a bit I puzzling. I wonder if the Robinson method didn't fully correct for stratification. I'm not sure, because the, you, in terms of stratification, BMI is less stratified than height. And if it was in some residual stratification there, probably have seen uh, some inflation in the height results as well. Mm -hmm. So, so look, it seems like it would be really great to have a statistical test that said, take BMI, a statistical test that would say even despite all the imperfections in our GWAS estimates and everything, there still must be forces other than assortative mating that are creating the phenotypic correlation of BMI between spouses, which would then tell you their forces like they're they're influencing what each other, you know, what you, what their spouse eats. And so is would it be possible to can, can you see how to construct a statistical test that would say 
just, you know, just spouse selection alone cannot account for this correlation, or just spouse selection on genetic stuff can. Well, I think the the short answer is no. I, I, I don't have any idea of how to implement that test. But I, I feel like one of the reasons why in that study I, I, was, I really want to match with the, to come up with something that I, I can predict some theory was also to, to be able to answer that question. Because if we have a theoretical prediction based on things we know from the population, the correlation, the phenotypic correlation, the heritability, we can try to see to which extent what we observe on the pillaging score uh, scale is something which is you know, plausible or probably explained by some other factors we haven't observed. So I sort of partially answer your question. I think having a strong uh, th theoretical expectation helps a lot. Uh, but I feel like you know, ideally you want to have a uh, combined a method like that where with spouses and also you know, longitudinal data that will give like, the best three-dimensional picture of what's happening in terms of uh, source dependency. Uh, my, my, excuse me. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll probably just uh, con conclude. Uh, so skip that part. I just wanted to say, s jump to the um, to things. So assortative mating is a, it's a, it's a long-standing question. You know, people have been, as I said at the beginning, people are interested in that uh, regardless of your research interest. You know, sociologists or epidemiologists, geneticists. Uh, one of the reasons why this has become I think more interesting lately is because of this the availability of genetic data. So we can sort of revisit many of those questions with a different angle and, and hopefully get more, more uh, new answers. So what has been happening in this area over the past years, there's a lot of methodological research happening in terms of, well, okay, we have this data, but how can we actually you know, combine that and find a, you know, come up with powerful methodology? So what I, I, expanded, I explained today is one of the met methodology. I know that uh, uh, Patrick has been working on different methodology as well. And, and also there is a lot of work happening where you still have spouses, spouse data and you, uh, plus genetic data and you want to learn things like uh, how similar spouses are on their, you know, the genetic relationship between spouses. Uh, and it, can it be explained by, uh, oops, by assortative mating or something else? Uh, and also another part of the research happening is also a research about um, trying to break down those correlations that we observe. Are they environmental? Are they um, genetic or may, may driven by mate choice? And this is particularly important for, as I said, for you know, understanding how the prevalence of a certain disease or a certain condition can increase over time. Uh, just here, I wanted to mention some examples. Uh, uh, there is a, a lot of, uh, so people have been looking, I'd like to up here, just probably highlight one study here, which is this, the study that looked at um, assortative mating uh, in, the, in, in the Latino populations, um, Hispanic populations, and they looked at assortative mating on the level of European Europeanness. And it's interesting that there is evidence of that, and that we can actually trace it back because if you have you no know, admixed population, you can, uh, if you have ref reference panels, you can map regions that probably come from your. Uh, European background or your African background or your nati Native American background. And so they've been able to revisit many of those questions uh, where you, you f there is some indirect uh, evidence of people mating on their, on their European-ness. You know, if you look at the, the gradient of skin color, you found some correlation there. But it's interesting that we can also quantify that if you have SNP data or genetic data, you can see what's happening and you can actually find scale and see that it's probably happening on certain region uh, and, and not on others. So a lot is happening there as well. And what is yet to be uh, studied? Well, a lot of things. Uh, how assortative mating changes over time? This is a, a very interesting question and a lot is happening at the moment in this direction. Uh, this cross-trait assortative mating is an interesting uh, question you know, because obviously you know, we don't only assort on, on height or IQ. Just, it's probably a combination of, of many things. And understanding how all these traits play with you know, uh, influencing your mate choice is an interesting question as well, which we can also address with those methodologies. 
more recently, basically three months ago, I started to be interested in life change, uh, lifetime change of associative mating. And I was talking about that yesterday with Lauren as well. And basically the question is, if you, have the, if you get to, to, to choose multiple partners over time, which I think given the rate of divorce is probably happening, would you change your strategy? Were you going to revisit your criteria, increase some of them? And interestingly, I think with some of the methodologies that the one that I presented today or the one that Patrick's doing is developing is that if you have, for example, samples of half sips, you can try to learn something about changes in the, their mating strategies over time because half sips are instances where you know, at some point you, you, you went with a different partner and there is evidence of that. So if we can tr try to trace it back, that will be very interesting to look. You know, maybe the answer is no, people have a one single strategy over time and doesn't change. That's an interesting thing as well. And, uh, and I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much for listening. And I'll take your questions if you have some, if you're not completely brainwashed. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very interesting question. I, I think, um, you know, going back to this uh, study that I mentioned about uh, um, assortment on ancestry, you know, in admixed population, right. you probably were thinking about something like that. You, you may have come across that. And there is actually evidence, uh, I don't, just can't, can't remember on top of my head what is that paper. Uh, but if you, the level of Europeanness you find in, um, in say uh, Latino or you know, even, uh, even I think even African Americans is, uh, is larger on the autosome than it is on the X chromosome, mm -hmm. which basically is showing that there is assortment on ancestry, but with some sort of safe direction with females uh, from say African background uh, being more often uh, selected. I think. So I think that's uh, one of the things we can we can address, I think ancestry is, an is in a good example because it has very strong effect, you know, it's easy to map. Uh, I think for m most of the complex traits, it's, it will be still challenging because you know, the X chromosome doesn't explain a lot of variance in many traits. So you, you want to have a, a case where you have, yeah, you have enough power to detect. So I, su I suppose the short answer will be depends on the power. Yeah, in the hot tub last night, <laughs> we were talking about um, nice. uh, very strange um, sex ratios among, among different demographics in Russia. Um, and I, I'm, quite, I'm quite struck by the paper at the beginning, about, um, which, which I don't talk about too much, about sources of dating um, when online dating was, was uh, brought about in, I can't remember which country. Korea. Are there, are there more papers uh, about sort of differences in the sources of mating that might occur in kind of very unusual uh, making environments? Uh, I'm not sure, actually. I think this that paper was, um, I actually brought it because it was an interesting fact. Uh, I'm, not sure, I'm not even sure if it has been replicated. So I just found it interesting. So sorry, I, I, didn't, I hope I didn't mislead you to like, sort of investigate some area which might be a dead hand. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I think, yeah, I think we have, well, yeah, I, I can. Well, just think about looking at the, the change of uh, uh, you know, your, your mating strategy over time. And if you have multiple partners, that that's an interesting question. So the short answer is, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what is out there in terms of uh, published paper. I know that we have a lot of data available. If you think about this, 
dating apps or we have a lot of things to investigate those questions. If at some point we can bring genetics into it, which is a bit dodgy, I think you know, people <laughs> are happy to share many information about how they select their, their, their partners and but you no, know, I'm not sure if having a Tinder genetics will, will fly. But I guess we have a lot of data to address these questions. I'm kind of curious whether there's some uh, debate about uh, which part of the couples or spouses that we need to include in this kind of studies. For example, we might want to discriminate uh, couples without child or <coughs> something like that. Um, okay, so you're talking about wh what I put the last part of the, of the study that I will publish last year, right? Which basically built everything on on couples that have produced offspring because we're using you know, observed uh, babies or individuals. Um, that's an, I think it's, it's an interesting, I feel like, yeah, it, would, it, it should bias, uh, if you think about uh, fitness being correlated with some of those traits, you know, height, I'm not sure to which extent height is, maybe a little bit. Uh, educational team and certainly, uh, So I skipped that part uh, in, the, in the presentation, but we looked at something um, as well. So if you have, we, we could identify people as potential spouses in the UK Biobank. And so under this theory, if everything, you know, if we've reached equilibrium, et cetera, which is you now may not may not be correct, you actually, you can actually find a correspondence between this theta parameter that you estimate within individuals, like just taking your odd versus even chromosome, and the population, the correlation between spouses, if you calculate the, the, the correlation of polygenic scores from the whole genome between spouses, and the relationship is just, this theta is um, half of the correlation between spouses. So when we plot, we look at this, the correspondence between our, those estimates in the UK Biobank, we found that they were very consistent. So suggesting that so those spouses were selecting the UK Biobank Bank without uh, especially specifying that they must have had children together. So I think the part, I think short answer is uh, there is a selection bias. I think that's probably um, uh, influencing. To which extent it does, I'm not sure it does it has a strong effect because of this ex second secondary analysis that I'm just, I just described. So are one of my co-author want to add something? Yeah, Lauren. I was wondering if you looked at any um, reproductive fitness traits, and, and and whether how strong assortative mating is in other species, or whether that's something. Obviously, you can't look at social traits in other species. Well, maybe you could. I don't know, but I. I yeah. Or if this is. So yeah, among the, those thirty-two traits, we had a uh, many traits, including um, psychiatric disorders, uh, which I was excited about. Maybe we found something. Uh, and also re reproductive traits uh, like um, you know, um, age at menarche or a number of children. You know, and, and I think we didn't find thing, uh, strong signals, at least significant evidence, because those, most of those GWAS are small. You know, if you compare the GWAS of height, which has about, at that time we used the GWAS with 200,000, almost 300,000 individuals, I think the, the GWAS of, you know, of um, age at menarche wasn't that uh, large, I think. I guess if we, in the, in the future, if we have larger GWASs, we might have more power so to detect so those yeah, effects. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.